it, it, picture the scene. It was a bright, relatively warm day. I remember the sky was blue. All I had was that there was somebody seen uh, on a roof of a high-rise building in Canary Wharf. Canary Wharf was in full swing as the financial hub. I can't remember whether I drove myself or somebody else drove me, but anyway, we went very quickly on blues and twos. Police were already there and sure enough, just about could see somebody um, very high up uh, on, the, on the roof. The information was quite scant. Didn't really know who this guy was other than he, he worked in the, in the vicinity through a set of double glass doors which went out onto the roof um, there was this young guy he was smartly dressed he was obviously not over 30 uh, he had a very mo a mop of blonde hair i remember um, but he was dressed in a suit and he was injured in his shoulder he had a knife and he he wounded himself in his in his shoulder and he kept putting this knife to this wound and digging around and he was bleeding quite profusely um, and he constructed a sort of um, almost like a gangplank off the edge of the building from some bits of wood that were up there I guess been left lying around by builders or whatever and he kept going to this gangplank and standing up which was scary to watch because you know I don't want this guy to jump there were times when yeah absolutely I'm, I'm desperately struggling what do I say next but that's really come about because of some of his as it happened lucid moments with very reasonable responses wow I mean not knowing what to say is terrifying in um, in any situation but by using simple techniques you know lots of listening and having the confidence to buy yourself some thinking time then we can all have better more convincing conversations ourselves, you know, whatever the situation. You want to establish some dialogue as quickly as possible. It doesn't take a genius to figure out if they're in dialogue, what are they not doing? They're not jumping. They're not self-harming. They're not threatening to harm somebody else. If, if you can establish some meaningful dialogue. So forget for a moment solving the problem because I'm never going to do that. And I'm not there to solve the problem. I'm there to stop him jumping. Today. I'm Martin Richards. He's Chris White. And we are hostage and crisis negotiators with over 20 years global experience. And this is Convincing Conversations. It's a podcast where we want to help you, whatever your situation or background, to have better and more effective conversations with the people around you. So how is this man standing on this walkway at height and Chris's brain going blank at times, uh, which does often happen, actually? How is that going to help you? Well, today we're going to talk about mirroring, reflecting, echoing, uh, a great technique which demonstrates that you're actually listening to the person and it actually takes no thought and it's highly effective. Great to use when you are stressed or anxious yourself. And by the end of this podcast, you'll be able to subtly direct a conversation where you want it to go. You'll be able to pick out and identify any hooks in the conversation and nudge that conversation along where maybe in times when you can't think of anything to actually ask or anything to say either because you're so overwhelmed or stressed yourself, or maybe you're just not actually interested in what you're hearing. And we've all been guilty of that. And mirroring can also be useful in the all-important business communication. Let's say a sales pitch, you know, where you, you want to show you're listening to the client, but at the same time, you need some thinking time before you respond to that, mean, you know, with that meaningful response back to that client. And it's also useful, you know, in, in domestic scenes where you're presented with an angry individual who needs to vent and it demands a response from you, but you can't think of a way to get that person to calm down. I mean, Chris, picture yourself in a supermarket or, or yep. a restaurant, you know, anywhere out in public mm -hmm. where there's lots of people around and you're confronted by an angry member of the public who's 
you know, raising their voice, they're jabbing a finger, you know, inches from your face, accusing you of some behavior immediately. Um, you know, you can be overwhelmed by, by what's happening there. And at this point, you know, you, your brain finds it very difficult to, to process, you know, what's going on. Um, there's an element of surprise there. Um, there's a perceived risk, uh, a, a, you know, a perceived risk of loss and control. There's a shortage of time. Um, you can adopt like a siege mentality, uh, if you like, and just freeze. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't think of anything to say in, in that sort of situation. I've frozen, Martin. No, you're right. It is quite a frightening thing, isn't it? When um, your mind's gone blank, it's just scrambled egg in there. You don't know what to say. And and what happens is it be- it becomes about winning. Because we don't know what to say that's constructive, we just go into that. And, you know, it's that old saying about fight, flight or freeze, isn't it? And we go into a, a protective fight mode um, and we just want to win. We'll say anything rather than the right thing. And it just becomes... Um, a battle. No one backs down. Anger increases. No one's listening. We've talked about that before. People get emotional and they can't listen. They can't hear anything. And of course, then you've just got a toxic exchange and the focus of that conversation um, has disappeared. It's been forgotten. So that's interesting. So when we're overwhelmed, we can either freeze or, as you say, Chris, get into this fight mode because of the stress. And this is where um, mirroring can help. The, the the way I describe mirroring and echoing with a conversation, <clears throat> you know, when they are on a roll, talking about something that's important, it's like the WD-40 of a conversation. It's a little squirt of oil into the conversation. And all I have to do is is to repeat back a word that is emotive to you at that particular time. And you will keep mm. talking. And it's a gentle little squirt of oil oil the wheels and that's and all it requires is a word or two um and making it sound easy probably is the skill yeah um and and being so, subtle is is important yeah. so there's there's verbal and there's non-verbal mirroring and mm-hmm. effectively it's an acknowledgement of you know someone's behavior so let's concentrate on verbal which is non-threatening and we can also use these techniques, which we'll show later in emails and in, and in text. So one of the ways to use mirroring is just to repeat the last few words spoken by the person. Simple. Okay. For example, someone might say, you know, I've had a stressful journey today and I've, I've missed my train. You would respond back with, missed your train. Now, if your tone raises at the end of the statement, it even sounds like a question. Mm. A question which you didn't have to think about. And this will encourage the person to expand on their original statement, which in turn gives you thinking time and supplies you more information for you to explore. Let, let's demonstrate this. Okay. So just mirror the last word or the last few words that I that I mentioned to you. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go out for some exercise. Some exercise. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go out cycling today. Cycling? Yep, mountain biking though, Chris. More fun. I did fancy a run, but it's easier to cycle. Um, And you see much more of London. More of London? Yeah, parks, landmarks. You know, I do like to visit the parks. You know, nearest to the country I get, I suppose. Oh, the country. Yeah. In fact, I love the South West. So you see there, it also helps the other person to clarify their own thinking. Uh, And the other person will also often rephrase and supply more details after after you've mirrored. So just by Chris mirroring me there, which took little effort, we found out that I like parks, I find cycling easier, and I prefer to be in the southwest. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was just by Chris mirroring the last word, two words, two or three words that I mentioned. Now, how much effort did that take, Chris? Well, none, really. None at all. Yeah. And how easy was it? Oh, it's, it's very easy. 
quick question. Mm. Does it have to be the last couple of words? I mean, my, my, the reason for asking that is if you have a word that is, is obviously um, packed with emotion, for example, um, mm. or, you know, a very, I would, uh, I would say it's got a lot of energy in it. Can you can you reflect back that word if it's if it's clearly something? I'm trying to think of an example. If somebody said, "I hated my days at school," could you just reflect back that word? Would that have the same impact, the same effect? Yeah, and and we'll talk about uh, picking out hooks uh, later right. uh, on this podcast. So that that's a good point. And and yes, I mean in that word, I'll probably pick out the word hated mm, because it's it, it, it yeah. I mean, as an aside, it's also good to use if you're a victim of an armed mugging, a, a, a street robbery, for example. You know, at that point, you can be quite reckless. There's lots of adrenaline. There's fear on both sides. And if somebody was to shout, you know, give me your purse, for example, uh, at that point, you may dart your hand into your pocket and the protagonist might think you're reaching for a weapon or even your phone to call mm. the police. You know, are you showing that you actually heard them? So you may have unwittingly increased the risk, you know, to yourself at that point. And so it's critical for you to let the person know that you've heard them. You certainly won't be able to reply with anything meaningful. You know, oh, no problem, Mr. Robert. Please allow me to uh, place my hand in my pocket and bring out my purse for you. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's not going to work, is it? We're well, not going to think about it. So you, no. your brain is overwhelmed, like we've been talking about. So just to repeat back again, the same words that they've used with the same rhythm, like, you know, give me your purse, just to repeat back my purse. As you reach into your pocket may save your life. And you've demonstrated that you've actually heard the person mm. so that's just an aside you know another example of how you can use mirroring uh in situations so let's go back to your jumper then chris so yeah. what do we know about this man so far then well i didn't know a, a huge amount about him i mean obviously you've got sources of information the way he was dressed uh mm. he was smart or or had been i mean he was a bit disheveled by that time but he was smart. He, he was articulate. He was he was educated. That was obvious. When he was lucid, he was talking about drugs. He was talking about family. He was talking about parents. And he, what was coming across, was that he'd thought about what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually quite difficult in the moment to really unpick his argument um, without just arguing because it isn't going to work just by saying, well, I think you're wrong. Um, don't do it. Um, you know, this isn't, he didn't wake up that morning probably with this in his mind. You know, this has probably been a long time in the making. There were times when I found it really difficult to say anything that didn't sound fatuous, to be honest. It, he had a logical way of talking when he was lucid mm -hmm. what there was though was indications through words that things were actually quite important to him so when he mentioned parents or drugs or family or work in order not to say the wrong thing or something that was meaningless um i use this this technique mirroring just to reflect back those important words to get more from him. So for an example, he was, he was worried about the fact that he'd let his parents down. So I just reflected back parents and I got names from his pair about his parents, what his parents were called, um, which introduced, you know, a, an important emotion to the conversation. I reflected back drugs and he volunteered that he uh, used cocaine. Um, it turned out that he was employed and he was in the financial industry, but he was having lots and lots of personal problems. He was only 26. But for significant periods of time, I didn't actually say very much. 
other than reflecting back these words that he was using that were quite important to him. And, and as you say, it gave him the opportunity to elaborate on some of those things, give me an opportunity to think. And of course, crucially, whilst he's doing that elaboration, he's not harming himself because he did have a knife and he had wounded himself in the shoulder. He was asking for alcohol, which obviously I couldn't give him. Um, so whilst he was talking, he wasn't hurting himself any further. And that was really just by echoing back either important words or, as we've just demonstrated, the last couple of words of his sentence. Yeah, what you've done there, Chris, if you answered the question that you posed me uh, around hooks, because what the person says to us invariably is in what is really going on. And we have to listen so carefully for maybe that one word to pick up that hook there's often a conversation going on that gets prickly or worse the truth the truth is out there in that conversation mm. uh, and we need to direct that person to towards what that hook is and mirroring is a great way to talk about those hooks without making them a, a huge issue mm. or switch on to that person if you like that you want to talk about you know that that point so for example Let's demonstrate this. Ask me what I did this morning, Chris. Um, okay, Martin, what did you do this morning? So, Chris, I got up this morning. I decided to walk up the road for a cup of coffee, went to my local coffee place. It's small. It's local, not, not a large chain. Then I walked back. I had some toast for breakfast. Such an interesting morning, this. Uh, I read the news on my tablet and... Decided to record a new podcast with you. Oh, a small local cafe. Yeah. Um, I don't like coffee in those large chains because it's too commercial. Too commercial? Yeah, like the smaller businesses, you know, they've, they've got it tougher, particularly nowadays. They've got it tougher? Yeah, it's it's they've got to work harder, you know, hence you get genuine, sincere conversations that I I find better service, you know. Okay, so so I, I had a bit of a choice there. Here I picked out um, that coffee in a in a, a local small independent coffee shop was part of your day. Um, yeah, and that's where I in this instance that's where I wanted to go with the conversation. So I just reflected back about with simple mirroring, and I took you back to the coffee shop. Now you might have wanted to talk about what you read on your tablet, but I directed you subtly to a particular part of that conversation and it, and it is subtle uh it's better than making a huge issue out of what we call that hook by which i mean i could have said now martin what i want to talk to you about is that that coffee you had this morning as i think it's important for us to discuss now if i had said that how would you have been feeling and thinking i'll be thinking why do you want to talk to me about this and if I was at work, for example, and this is a work conversation, and you you bigged up the topic to such a degree, I'd be thinking I'm in trouble. What's made it so important to you? And also what's, in, what's important with that little demonstration we did is that I actually didn't, you're right, I actually didn't want to talk about that part mm. of the conversation. Mm. But you kept me on that just by mirroring those last few words. Exactly. And and I think it's worth also pointing out when when people – you're in a position of leadership, for example, and somebody comes to you or it's, it, could, it could be a friend or it could be a complete stranger. Very mm. rarely do they open up with what the real issue is. And no. to give you an example, um, you and I will both, sadly, a pretty common scenario um, when negotiators are called to domestics, domestic problems. Something's happened. It's normally a man not always, but usually, um, there's been a row, there's children in the premises, he's barricaded himself in with his partner or maybe not, and the children. Um, he's shouted at the police, somebody's seen a weapon or something. As I say, sadly, this is going on all over the country. Um, and we would be called to that situation. And how often has it happened to you where when you turn up, the police officers that have been there first, 
because somebody's dialed 999 to a violent thing and they've said, this is what we know. He's barricaded himself in, but don't mention the children because we did that and he started to shout and scream and bash the door and everything else. And we know that sooner or later we're going to have to mention the children because that's clearly the emotive issue here. And yeah. this is a way of subtly directing the conversation where we want to go. We won't do it straight away, yeah. of course, but this is a way of doing that. Well, what I'm going to do now then, is let's bring it into the work context. So I want you now, Chris, I'm going to give you a, you're my boss. I'm going to come to you with a problem and I want you to, pick out what you think the hook is in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yep. Here, yeah, boss, listen, I'm having some problems at, at home. Um, I just want to inform you about my wife. She She's had an affair, um, getting angry all the time. She reckons that she's in love with someone else. But you know, don't worry about it. I've got I've got my own way of dealing with this, and I just need to say calm for the kids. You know, it won't affect me at work. Um, she even says she's going to move this guy in. You know, but I find work helps me to get out of the house. So I'm just telling you because I, I think you should know. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Your own way of dealing with it. Yeah, you know, I've got my own way of calming myself down. A way of calming yourself down. Yeah. Look, if I'm honest, I, you know, I'm, I suppose I'm drinking a bit more, but, you know, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So, um, and there we are. So that, that doesn't, it doesn't come easily. I had to listen very carefully. There were lots of potential hooks in there because some very mm -hmm. emotive language. Why did you pick that one? Because the tone of your voice for me was quite matter of fact around the other issues, but you wanted to go away from your way of dealing with it. You were quite dismissive. Don't worry about it. I've got my own way of dealing with it. Well, to me, that was the hook. I would imagine if I'd reflected back some of the other issues, you may, because some of this is about trying, you may have been okay with telling me about the other issues, but my mm. own way of dealing with it was masking something. You didn't tell me what way or which way. You just said you had a way, and I suspect you didn't really want to tell me what that way was. So let's peel back that layer by presenting you back with way of dealing with it. Now, you yeah. might have felt a little bit uncomfortable but I'm subtly focusing on a bit of the conversation that might help me learn a bit more about what's going on. Yeah, and that was there was an element of risk, wasn't there, as well? You, mm -hmm. you could ident your own way of dealing with it. That that sounds a bit risky for me. So if I was listening to that conversation and had to pick out a hook, for me that would have given me a red flag around around risk. So your yeah. man on the walkway, then what? I think you mentioned a couple of hooks. Were there mm. any more? Uh, I think drugs was one. Yeah, drugs was one. Um, uh, you know that that was clearly a risk for him to to elaborate on that because where do you get your drugs from? Mm. You know that's that's one direction that conversation could have gone in. Now, I wasn't mm. going to take it in that direction because what am I here to do? You know, we said right at the beginning, I'm there to stop him jumping today not to really drill into where he gets his drugs from. That's my mm. objective. So uh, it was more around trying to bring some reality to him about what was important. Um, I mentioned before it was about parents. It was about drug use. It was about failure. He mentioned failure, mm. um, letting down. These are all very emotive things that I, I um, just reflected back. And I said... I didn't actually talk very much. It was just feeding back the important aspects that were in his mind at that particular time, bearing in mind, of course, that 
he was not in a in a stable place, a stable state of mind at all. It's unlike you not to talk very much. So that must you, have been you've said quite that hard before. You. You've said that before. Yeah, yeah. but it's uh, <laughs> on this particular occasion, I was able to overcome my natural urges. Yeah, and the question people often ask us, and this is where I want to reassure people that it's because you've mirrored me a fair bit today in our demonstrations, mm. and the question people often ask is, well, surely. Um, if you keep doing this, people are going to realize what they're doing. But as you've just said, they don't because they are so wrapped up in what they're talking about. We all love the sound of our own voice. Mm. And when people are on a roll, particularly if they're talking about something which is passionate to them, they won't have a clue that you're mirroring. No, they Uh, won't. And we know that. So once we've unpicked these hooks, Mm. We're now going to develop an idea of mirroring a step further because words themselves aren't the only things we know we can mirror. We can mirror pace, tone, and and actual language. That's also important. Yeah, it is. We listen very carefully to the rhythm and tone of words spoken and because we, we can get we can get an awful lot from that. You you can almost gain as much from pace and tone as you can from the actual words because it will give you a big clue as to emotion, energy, passion. Are they soft? Are they loud? Are they quick and jerky? Are they slow and ponderous? Um, Mm. Does this person speak in very clipped bullet point language? Are they sort of firing bullets at you? Or is it it long and meandering? And and my young man on the roof, uh, he went into some quite long monologues I couldn't even understand a lot of them, to be honest, because he was bleeding and he'd obviously either had drugs or alcohol that day, I would suggest. So all those things can give us a clue about um, about how to match and, and um, pace and lead. And there's things called Milliman encouragers, which these are the, the verbal nudges we give each other in conversations, particularly on telephones, they're the uh uh-huhs, the right, the okays, the oh, right, I gotcha, those sort of nudges. And we know that you can also mirror the pace and tone of those uh, in a conversation on the phone. So, for example, I'm now talking with this sort of rhythm to you, Chris, Mm -hmm. your nudges back to me, your, your... verbal encouragers back to me would yeah. be that rhythm yeah yeah so like you're doing now mm-hmm. the yep the yep yeah whereas if i'm talking to you with a very relaxed very calm slow tone your millimill encouragers back to me would be okay right go i on. see go on so you see that that pace and tone is matching how i'm talking mm. at that point whereas if i was to speed up again and start talking like this to you on the telephone your milliman encouragers are more yep Go on. That's it. Mm. So you're matching the pace uh, and even tone of of how I'm talking. Mm. But it's not an easy thing to do. See, pacing and matching your your rhythm and tone and pace takes takes practice. But mirroring the, the words, as we've been demonstrating, that's just an easy thing to do. Mm because you're just actually repeating back what, what the person has said, which, which was what we've shown. Uh, so what was your guy on the walkway like? What was his rhythm? What was his tone as he was talking to you? Well, it, it, it changed several times, actually. Um, mm. You know, he, he sometimes he'd be quite agitated, which was worrying. Um, but, you know, when he was quiet, um, he sounded upset. He sounded depressed. Um, mm. lots of lots of self-reflection. So there were short sentences, and very slow, lots of gaps between sentences. Now, of course, you've got to set this against the backdrop of this is 
not a common occurrence in in Canary Wharf. It's attracting a lot of attention. Um, there's other emergency services around. There's lots of frenetic activity going on. Um, what I what I had to do was slow down, and and almost create a a bubble with him and I in it, where we're following our own pace, or I could follow his pace more to the point regardless yeah. of the frenetic activity that was um that was going on around me so and that's as you say that's not an easy thing to do if i'd been matching the activity going on around me then it makes it around that rather than the important thing which is listening to him and responding appropriately to him i suppose the thing i want to end up with here chris is and we mentioned it at the beginning is mirroring uh in print um, yeah, I was thinking about that. You know, can, can, does this work in that in print? Oh, I think so. Yeah, it uh, and you've and you've got more planning time. Yeah, particularly with emails. You know, do they use, for example, the person you're responding to an email? Do they use short or long sentences? Lots of bullet points or big paragraphs? How do they begin and end their emails? Is it hi, dear Mister Richards? Do they end with like best or kindest regards? Do they use lots of exclamation marks? Uh, I've used a company to book um, holiday villas before in Greece. And the people I was, was dealing with, every single message they would send back would have about 15 exclamation marks in it. It was just the way that they crafted their emails. Mm -hmm. So I sent back my emails with lots of exclamation marks in it because they clearly like talking that way in print. I know a good way to build rapport is to mirror. So I responded with, it, it was, ad, for me, it was awkward, but I know that that's how they like to communicate in email. So I did the same. So that, um, okay. So something that I think this is really important. Mm. There's millions of people now who use devices of varying kinds almost as a primary means of communication. There's so many social media platforms, so many means of communicating with other people. We know that mental fitness amongst young people and not so young people is a real issue. Tell me how I can use mirroring and reflecting in a social media platform environment. How when when there might be something wrong there might be something underlying because that's that's a challenge well i can give you an example where i had to negotiate with somebody via text um this was a person who was in a crisis driving around the streets of london okay. uh, under the influence of drugs and i was sitting with his best friend communicating via his phone i knew what i needed to say to the person but i really I really didn't have the, if you call it street lingo, I really didn't know how to, I couldn't understand the rhythm or the time and pace of the replies that he would expect from his friend. So I was sort of acting as an interpreter. Sorry, his friend was sort of acting as an interpreter for me. So I would want to say, please don't do anything rash. But his friend would never text that to him. His text would translated into something like hey bro chill yeah mm. driving under the influence of drugs is a dangerous thing to do and you you may un injure others would become something like those tabs are not good for driving dude mm. now, <laughs> now clearly that's not the way i talk um is it text is it not well for, no funnily enough no it's not um but you get the point, you know, I needed to mirror his language yeah. to help build that rapport and to convince him that he was talking to his friend. So mm. th there was a classic case where oh, it would be a total mismatch, you know, and even if he knew he was talking to me, I would still have to adjust my language yeah. in order to get on some level playing field with him in order to build rapport. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I as I say, I, I think that's a – a really important part of the discussion because so much, and it's not going away, is it? You know, communication over devices is um, 
mm. is so prevalent. You know, some people sit in the same room and still mm. communicate via a device, um, particularly if there's images attached to it and that sort of thing. So uh, it, it's a it's a really crucial area, I think, which mm. is um, which is interesting, as I say, because it's not that's only going in one direction, as we all know. So what we talked about today, then, well, we talked about how by repeating the last few words that somebody says demonstrates you've heard them. It's really easy to do, and it is so useful when you can't think of anything to say, and especially if you yourself are overwhelmed and or stressed. It's subtle, and it's a fantastic way, as you demonstrated with my um, coffee and my, uh, my wife having an affair example, in order to bring out those hooks that you think are important uh, and steer the conversation uh, to where you want it to go. And it's not just the words, it's pace and tone. And as we've just mentioned, you can put it into emails, into text messages, just with a little bit of, of thought as well. And if I was to say the single most important thing to remember about mirroring is it takes no effort. It's little thought, it's easy to do. And it, it demonstrates demonstrates listening. But Chris, we can't end this podcast without hearing what happened to your poor man uh, on the walkway. Uh, well, eventually he he did come down, which was you know a, a good thing because it, uh, apart from anything else, he needed medical attention. But he did come down. He agreed to come down, and he was taken away in an ambulance to get the attention that he needed. I was exhausted. It was a scary situation. There were times when I thought he was going to go, that was the time to try and keep the dialogue going. And just by mirroring important words, that did keep the dialogue going. So it might be, and I'll never know, but it might be that just doing that stopped him from jumping that day. Job well done. Thank you. So I'm Martin Richards and he's Chris White on Convincing Conversations podcast. And today we've been talking about mirroring. If you've liked what you've heard, please go and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, share it with your friends and help them have better conversations too. It all makes a difference. And in the next podcast, we're going to be talking about how we talk and deal with difficult people. I look forward to it, Martin. See you then.